Okay, we are in Emur Ubitachon, the Ish uh, Morality in Halacha, and we are on page 120, section 25. Just as our sages spoke at length about Torah without fear of heaven, so they spoke at length of fear of heaven without Torah. I have both. I can, have, I can be Yerod Shemayim, Yerod Shemayim, but not have Torah. So in Mishnah, in the Mishnah of Avot, Pirkei Avot, chapter 2, it says, There is no ignoramus who has fear of heaven, and no Amha Aretz who has uh, who is a chassid, which means doing more than is requested of him. And in Shabbat, the Gemara Shabbat, uh, page 63a, it says, if a Torah scholar avenges, avenges himself and bears grudge like a snake, gird yourself from with him, and there is attach yourself to him. If an Amma'art is a chassid, do not live next to him. That's an interesting Gemara. Okay. Uh, regarding the Amaret, the sages of the Mishnah dis- disagreed as to his essence. And the Gemara Brachot, 47b, they came to the conclusion that if someone has learned and studied but has not spent time in apprenticeship with Torah scholars so as to learn from their ways, that person is considered and I'm an art, an unlearned person. So again, it gets to this whole concept of which he starts to develop before, that if I don't learn halakha, and of course, it, along with the the Gemaras, then I'm not a Talmud Chacham, no matter how much I know. And now here is even going further, forget Talmud Chacham, now we're throwing you into the unlearned. Because what you did was, you learned, you studied, but you didn't spend time with the Torah scholars, which would mean you didn't find out how to apply this. You didn't, you didn't see Maisarav, what we call Maisarav, the action of the rabbis, how they would be involved and how they would live life according to the Torah. So if you didn't do this, even though you have the intellectual understandings or knowledge, it doesn't get you out of the category of being unlearned. You're still an Amar according to that. Of Yisrael Salanta, Zichron of Rachel, that's what the El means, wrote, uh, may, he be remembered for, may his memory be remembered in peace, wrote in one of his letters that the meaning of observing Torah scholars nowadays is a study of the deep discussions that were handed down in the, to the halachic authorities from the people of the Great Assembly as were handed down to them from the elders and from the prophets, so that everything that was said to Moshe Rabbeinu on Mount Sinai has reached all the way to our generation. Talk about the unbroken chain. Okay, the Chazan Ish, uh, I'm sorry, Rav, he's quoting Rav Yisrael Salanta to say that that's why we have to observe the Torah scholars, not because they have their innovations, not for their innovations, not for their brains, not for anything else, but it's simply because they are the living chain to, for, to Sinai. So when you see what they're doing, it's not because they thought, wow, this is a good thing to do. Rather, it's something that they were taught to do. And that has a tremendous power as far as tradition is involved, or passing on the tradition. A person who has not spent many years laboring over the study of Gemara and has that's a Talmud and has not exerted himself to understand the Torah of the Rishonim, which would be Rashi, the Ramban, uh, the Rambam, the Ramban, the, and uh, the Rosh, I believe, also falls in that category. So you have the, all those giants, and so if you didn't uh, exert yourself to understand the Torah of the Rishonim enough to acquire the extra understanding to fathom Abaya and Rav's inquiries as expression, an expression meaning the Talmudic discourse, so clear, uh, clearly, has surely deprived his soul of the title of Chaver, another name for a Torah scholar. Now, Chaver 
was is a specific name for a group of people in the Sinaiic period, I believe it goes that far back, that accepted upon themselves only to eat even non-Kodesh foods, non-holy foods, just regular kosher foods, at the level of, of if they were Kodesh, holy, and sacrifices. They wanted to maintain that level of purity. So there's voluntarily, there's voluntarily doing that. But you would have to be part of the group. And if you did that, so then there were many restrictions, actually that you acquired for yourself. In other words, you could not eat from the Yama Aret, who was a good Jew, 100% kosher, no problem with him or her. But because they didn't maintain that level, that extra level of, of purity, so and these other people did, a self-restricted restricted diet, as you, will, as you will, so there was already a separation. It does cause problems, even the Gemara, because the the, uh, the Talmud has, and the Talmud, Talmud was studying right now in Chagiga, actually. It talks about how careful one had to be when transferring this information over to the Amarts of what we can use and what we cannot use for them. Because if we make the defense too high, so they'll look at us and, and say, they look at the Chaver and say they're living in a ivory tower to the Haiti Toiti people. who are not interested and they will not learn from them and they'll just there'll be a tr- major split. So in order to keep everybody in the fold under one aura and not just have everybody do what they want to do, so there were some times that we could the Chaver could excuse me, I keep, I keep saying we that the Chaver could take from the Amaharts and could share products from the Amaharts and the they can. All depends on when, what the Amaharts would understand. And again, the Amaharts is totally kosher. There's no problem with what he's doing according to halacha. Absolutely none. Okay? He's doing everything he should be doing. But because he doesn't accept that high level, for whatever reasons he has, maybe just doesn't want to, and that's fine. But as a result, you have this, this split, okay, that we're talking about. That's what he's saying right here. If you want to be a Chavar, which is a part of being a, that's another name for Torah scholar. Today, by the way, it would be similar to the closest we, we will get to the that's of a feeling is if you have a person who is Chal of Yisrael, or Pas Yisrael, he'll only eat the Jew, baked by, he'll only eat the bread <coughs> baked by a Jew, or milk that the Jew is watching the milking process, or products, dairy products, with that level. If one does not, in other words, if one goes to Martin's and picks up any of the OU or QK breads that are kosher out there, that's fine. But they're not pasteurized. They're not bread that supervised that that a Jew had a process in the making of it. It's just a matter of we know that the product is kosher. So we saw that's what we call paspalta, the bread of a bakery, which is allowed to be eaten, no problem. So that's for the normal Jew out there. If you get that bread, 100%, you're doing good, no question. But if somebody wants to take it upon himself, that stringency of pastel, of bread only, he'll only eat bread, baked, uh, uh, baked or supervised, by a, a Jewish person being having some part of the process. So then that person cannot or should not eat my bread. Now again, there's leniency for everything I'm saying. Same thing with Chal of Israel. If the person takes upon himself this stringency, which anywhere but this country is not a stringency, but a reality, that you have to do it because we have USDA, Rav Moshe said we don't. Lechad Chila, we don't need that. But if you live in some other country where they don't have USDA policies, so then that law remains on the books very strongly. And nobody can have non-Yichal Yisrael. So you have to have that level of government intrusion in our lives 
in order to allow us to have that sort of milk from anybody. Okay, so when you're buying milk, you don't need to see an OU, ABH, you don't need anything. You can buy regular milk off the shelf, and it's not a problem because of the USDA. Anywhere else, again, you don't. But now, again, take that person who only will buy Golden Flow or Aviva or whatever the the uh, quality control brands are. Okay, when they now want to come to my house and again drink my uh, straws, Martin's milk, they shouldn't do it because they've accepted upon themselves a higher level. If they do, that's their business. They're not going to get involved. But really, they shouldn't. The Javier could not. That wasn't his choice anymore. Once you join the group, as far as I know, there was no leniency to go back to the other way. Hmm. You couldn't go. Because uh, they accept the bombs of something like that. So once you do that, you're part of it. Which also explains or gives an insight into Pirkei Avot and says, Ukne lecha chavir. Acquire for yourself a chavir. Which everybody translates as friend. Right. But it's really not friend in the... In the yeah. It's somebody, it's somebody who's at that high level, and that's why it says, lecha. If I really want, I'm making a rabbinic uh, tight share, but uh, a rabbinic interpretation. But it's uh, when you buy, you have to buy yourself basically into it to be part of that group where I'm buying into their philosophy. I'm also spending more money, so you better make sure that you're ready for it. Lecha which means to literally acquire for yourself a friend. Because it says, shower them with the gifts so, that so you can befriend them. And this is very important when you go to yeshiva or anything in, in life. When I always tell, I used to tell people, I, should, I don't tell people that much right now, but when I, I would go to yeshiva, when I went to yeshiva, I looked around very quickly. Now I saw one guy who I said, oh, this is a guy I want. So I'm, I became friendly with him. You pick your friend. It's not family. You pick your friend. Family, you can't pick. It's, it's what you get. Okay, but when it comes to friends, somebody who's going to bring you to the next level, that's what you want to do. You don't want to pick somebody who's going to lower you. You're not interested in that. You always want to go up and up and up and up. It should always be an upward spiral, not a downward uh, to the gutter. Okay, so that's why it says Chavir. So the sage is wishing to accompany, uh, to awaken people to the need to labor over Torah. Did not humor such a lazy person and call him an Amaharz, depriving him of special privileges. And it is possible that this is the Amaharz about whom it is said he cannot be a Chassid. Okay, he could be a Yare Shemayim, an Amaharz, and certainly fear God, but to go the extra mile is not going to happen. For the reason he just gave. It is customary to think that there is an obligation to establish Yeshivot in order to raise our children to Torah. He's saying sons, but it could, uh, it says the Gadil Banim in Hebrew could be children. The creation of Torah scholars is recognized as an obligation of great value, indeed, the most important thing in the world, upon which the existence of the entire generation depends. It says that the reason that we are giving Shabbat why did God give us Shabbat? In order that we should learn Torah. God said, six days you're going to be working. So that at least one day he's, you have to set aside to learn my Torah. It's not a day to sleep. Solely, anyway. You can certainly refresh yourself. But it's a day to really involve yourself along with your family in the study of Torah. That's what Shabbat is for. And that's because that's what the whole world is built on. But when it comes to finding the soul suitable for such a creation, the age of students is generally limited to a, to a set one, namely the time of youth. An adult, an older person who has not learned in his childhood, is already disqualified from being a student. He is seen as being totally unfit for the study of wisdom. He too does not see himself as being obligated to enter the basic medrash, the study hall, in order to seek Torah. He recognizes his obligation to study at the times what he already knows, but the obligation to raise his level of learning and to grow in it is far from him. 
and while and he while and he whiles away his life, having given up long ago. Okay. <laughs> Doesn't sound very nice. But Thank you for that. Spiritual there you go. <laughs> But he's looking at reality. People say, when they get older, I have no time. I don't understand. Ah, when I was younger, I could look at this and I would remember it. Now I have to work so hard. I've heard this. And I'm, you know what? It's true. The older we get, as Bill would always tell us, the dumber we get. <laughs> Even though we know how to learn and we've done all that stuff, we just, we get set in our ways. And we have our prejudices, and it's so hard to get past them. And it really works, you have to really work hard. So there are those people. I remember when I was in the yeshiva at uh, Or Sameach and Mansi, that there was an old man. And when I say old, I do mean old. Okay, he must have been, now, now, see, now, now, now it's not old anymore. It now, because I'm up there, so it's not that old. But at, we were all 20 year old. I think he was 70. So 20 year old to 70 year old is a nice oh. distance. There's an old man. And actually, he got married again while he was in the yeshiva. But the thing is, he put his time in. He, he became a shtickle tamal Yeah, and I, I don't know how far he went with it, but he really put his time in. He was in the base madras, he was learning, trying to keep up with the young, young whippersnappers that we were. And, uh, I mean, look, he was set in his way. There's no question about that. He had his mind, uh, and as he has his mind set. And then you had people who are a little younger, in the 50s. And, again, 30-year difference. is still all the cock and stuff. But it's uh, now, middle age. <laughs> but, it, then, but then it was, uh, those guys were doctors. Doctors, psychiatrists. And it was very interesting to see how they learned Torah. Well, that old man, by the way, was a lawyer, retired lawyer. And he gave me some of his books. That's why I remember he was a lawyer. But it's, uh, it, it's, they all had their problem trying to remember the stuff while we were just flying through the stuff. We were all from, just started, fresh out of college for the most part. So we were still in that learning mode. We hadn't taken off time yet to be part of the workforce and to be prejudiced and jaded and so on and so forth. These people did. Uh, they did take time off, and then they came. It was the world of the ballet Shuva at that point. So, it, but it was very, very interesting taking what he's saying, what he's saying, and remembering back to who it was easier to learn, who 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 found it easier to learn, and they didn't. It was very difficult for them to get into this argumentation of a bias, a relevance, so on and so forth. The rest of us, it was like okay. We've dealt with this sort of Mishigas and cultures all the way through. You disagree with this, you disagree, okay. But we figured it out. So you do see that sort of thing where it is it's very hard to get back into being a uh, student that can attain that level. I'm not saying you can't. If you really put your time in, you can do anything. But it's going to be much harder. There's not an, but he's saying, so again, uh, with everything I just said, he's saying this is not in accordance with the Torah approach. For as long as a person is alive, he is obligated to make every effort to grow. So you may think, that's what his point is, you may think, well, you know what, I can't do more than I'm doing. No, it's unacceptable to say that. It's not the Torah approach. True, teaching an old person is writing is like writing on paper that has already been written on and erased. In other words, I'm getting rid of your prejudice. Think about that, by the way. When I teach you something, you have to, well, not you. What's it called? Uh, the general you. What do you call that? Uh, I forget what Jim, Jim always said. What? No, no, no. Okay. When I teach a person who is an older person, as compared to a young kid, then I have to approach them in a wholly, to a totally different manner. I can sometimes use their knowledge to enhance it, but other times, like in Hebrew, to get the ch to, to adults, to get them to go chamor, like that, chamor, and without hurting the throat and without spitting and everything else, 
is very, very difficult. A kid? Has a, one, two, three. They don't have, they don't have any problems with it. It's an amazing thing. Okay. There is this thing, though, that as you grow up, your actual physical speech mechanism conforms hmm? to the language you speak. That's why it makes it difficult to learn something that has things that are diametrically different. Okay. Okay, so it, it, it could be it could be the physiological problem, I'm not yeah. arguing that. But it's also a mental problem because yeah. you people can say Bach with no problem. Mm -hmm. Some people. Some people cannot they say Bach. And when I say Bach I know I'm lost. <laughs> that is no way I'm gonna do this. But if the person says Bach, they when it's the chetz in the middle of the word, like berocheka, oh, that that's a killer, that's a killer, right? When you have, you have to think, what's going on? Berocheka is a killer for people if they don't know Hebrew from the beginning. For me, it's nothing. I can do it. I, I'm sure you can do it. You were in Israel, so I'm guessing you can do it. Okay, but it's uh, most kids that grow up learning Hebrew again. All Orthodox, probably most conservative, can do it. Comes to reform. I'm not sure anymore because they've changed. It used to be they could not. That was one of the hallmarks. They couldn't say a of their lives. Now I think they're teaching the chah again. I don't know why they didn't teach before. But uh, I remember years ago, that was one of the distinctions we had. They could not say the chah. They would say, uh, I'm not sure why they didn't get that sound. Yeah, repeat after me. Chai, how are you? There you go. But that, that was, like I said, that's what's going on. So he says, even though that no person is considered like somebody's written on and erased, but due to the immense value of this wisdom, the value of the ink of wisdom on erased paper is also immense and immeasurable. So even though you have prejudice, uh, you have prejudice in your learning. When you hear the Torah and you accept, well, even arguing with it, you still have that. And you may have to argue back and forth in your mind. Okay? So, you yeah, may have questions. For the guy, let's, let's be honest, for the scientist who becomes religious, he has to do mental gymnastics to put his scientific knowledge in line with Torah knowledge and try to have a synthesis which is why you have the books by Gerald Schroeder and uh, all, all these other books of uh, Primo, Le no, no, Primo, uh, some Levy guy, Levy, Aviezer, we have all the books there, where they talk about science and Torah, okay, because they want to make the bridge, they want to bridge that gap. And of course, what's his name? Uh, the zoo rabbi. Um, Come on, the zoo rabbi. He was put into Kherim. I was going to ask you if I can borrow that book. Yeah, so what's his name? Uh, I can't remember it. Slifkin. 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 Rabbi Slifkin. By the way, he doesn't absorb people put into Kherim for what he's writing, but okay. That's that's my personal opinion. Uh, he, and he was only put in by one group man. But it's, he used, again, Torah, and he's trying to get in line with science of today. And so he says, and for those who aren't concerned with it, wrong book, don't read the book. He's reminiscent of Maimonides, beginning of uh, The God's Perplex, where Maimonides says the same thing. If you remember, when we went through the introduction, he said, if these problems do not bother you, please do not read this book. If only if these problems bother you, then the book is for you. As long as you've done your studying and you know the Torah, A, B, and so on, so forth, the Rambam is much harder than Schlifkin. Slipkin doesn't say you have to know the book or the story. He just says we have problems, so we can deal with these things. <laughs> but the rest of them also don't do it. They don't. They all assume that they're going to answer every question that you have, and they present all this stuff in a very nice, readable manner. But again, if I don't have the question, then the books become just intellectual slaughter. So great is the loss. Of these people in the middle years, who did not marry study, who did not merit studying the inquiries of Abaya and Rava, in their youth they know that sitting in the house of Hashem 
All one's life is the true life on this earth. And with their energy and vigor, they uh, have made themselves a place in the base of, in the base of Medrash. But in the base of Medrash, they are wasting their time and efforts for not, not knowing what a person's obligation really and truly is. They neglect the labor of learning halakha. Again, we're back to that. And do not obligate themselves to engage in it. From there, they go on to do even worse, to belittle the learning of halakha. Sometimes only in their hearts, sometimes expressing their sentiments verbally. And this is very, very true. You will hear people who go through a gemara three, four, five, six, twenty times. Okay, and they will say, or they may think, I know how to rule. I know what you're doing. I understand the philosophy. In other words, if I understand the rule of what the rabbis are trying to say. So I just have to extrapolate a little. And I, that could get you to first base. It may get you into a file, a foul. Uh, it depends on what you're doing. And I, so I asked some people, did you go, after you came up with what you thought the halacha was, did you actually just follow it through? Or you just didn't say, no. I know. I, they all want to say, we basically know where they want to go, so no, we didn't do it. And that's what he's talking about. You cannot do that. Because you come to belittle when you hear the halakha. You say, as eh, one opinion, you're belittling, you're belittling the halakha for no reason. You didn't follow the argument all the way up. You just heard part one. You even may have gone a little more into it. But without really seeing how, the, how it progressed and came to today's time, following all their arguments, seeing what they're saying, you may... Uh, you probably will not understand it that well and may even laugh at it. The best example was you have Rabbi Herschel Schachter as a young man. Herschel Schachter is now one of the, the one of the leading rabbis in YU and he knows the Talmud, they say, by heart. I don't know if it's photographic memory, if you just studied a lot, I'm not sure. But he knows it like that. Okay, he can quote your halacha back and forth. So he told the story that when he was a young bacher in, in the yeshiva, he was a young boy in the yeshiva, with his chavrusa, his study partner, they decided that they're going to open up, they, they're going to yeah, open up one of Rav Moshe's responsa. They're going to read the question, close the book, and then talk it out, do the research, and then see if they were right. This is how Rev Moshe thought. Okay, really, that was their mode. Not that saying if anybody disagrees, disagrees with Rev Moshe, they're wrong, but they were using him as the litmus test. Okay, fine. Let's see if we can understand where it's going. So they spent, I think he said they spent probably two days. I think that's what it was. I forget. I don't want to cheat him up the story. But they spent some time on the question. They, they put down their answer. And then they opened the book, and they said, and the first line after the question, he quotes a, he quotes a Talmud that they didn't even know existed. He said, what? How did he go there? And then when they started to read it, they said, oh my God. You, unless you know, and this is his, his opinion to this very day, unless you know all of Talmud, you can never rule on Jewish law. That's what he holds. Because it's so, the sea is so wide, so expansive, that you thought you covered it because you asked a specific question. But here, when you go to a different Gemara who has one other thing you never thought of, because you didn't learn it, so that impacts directly on this question. And then you have to follow. So that's why when you see what people are doing to pull from this Gemara, from that Gemara, from this Rishon, that Rishon, Acheron, and so on and so forth, and you and you and you see you're watching it uh, develop. You're thinking, "Wow, these guys had nothing to do with their life. Nothing. They were worried about these picky little picky things." But when you see the total picture, you realize how important that picky young thing was. And you say, "Wow, without that, I never would have got this." That, so that's why he's saying. 
that if you don't engage in that, you'll just belittle the learning of halacha. Uh, okay, their tendency to protect their own sense of work so that their absence of knowledge in halacha won't be ashamed to them pushes them to look for faults in Torah scholars. Right? According to the limited understanding, it seems to them that indeed the scholars are on the lowest level and that they themselves are on the highest. For it is the nature of the proud uh, of pride to rest comfortably in the lap of fools. Mm-hmm. By the way, you see this today in science. I'm going to reverse the, the thing. Because in science, we always look backwards and laugh at what they did, saying they're fools. Yet, the more we advance and discover, new, rediscover new things, the more we appreciate, wow, there was something to what they were saying. Like the homeopath, the, 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 the Eastern, Eastern medicines. I'm not saying we should live on them. I'm not going to get into that, that argument. But they have an in, but a much better approach, it seems, than, we have in, than what we do in the Western uh, part, where we just deal with the symptoms. They were dealing with the causes. And they said, let's go back. Let's run this back. The investigation has to begin. And then we'll try to figure out what's happened, and so we can correct that. Because if you don't, all you do is took, take it away the pain and what we've learned, what we've all learned, is that pain is necessary because without pain, we really will hurt ourselves. <laughs> so we have, when a person doesn't have that pain sensor, it can be burned and everything else. So we thank God for the pain sensors that we have. We know we're doing something wrong. But what we do is, instead of worrying what we're doing, we just pop in a leaf. And that gets rid of the pain for a little while and we're happy. We can go to sleep, we can do what we want. Or the people who have, I, I love the commercial that talks about, and I haven't, I haven't seen commercials for a long time, thank God. But I remember this commercial that was advertising something for lactose intolerant people and said, Do you like pizza? Do you like this? Do you like it? Take this pill a half hour before going, and you two can start enjoying pizza. I'm thinking, Do you hear what they're saying? I, um, this stuff is poison to my system. But take this magic pill. The snake oil, guys. Take this magic pill and you too can enjoy your life again. I mean, what kind of nonsense is that? You're not looking at how the problem started. Let's the problem get to the, started when you get older, you stop manufacturing, manufacturing the thing that breaks down the lactate. Well, that's also young kids who have lactose intolerance. Yeah, well, that's because there's a defective mechanism. But usually lactose intolerance is caused if the system ages and it just breaks down. And I like taking the lactate because I do like eating pizza, so thank you for taking me out of that category that I'm poisoning myself. <laughs> or as a colleague of mine said, I don't worry about my high cholesterol, I just take my lipid and mm-hmm. eat what I want. Now that's a different story because the high cholesterol can kill you. Lactase intolerance can't kill you. It makes you very uncomfortable. It's actually being replugged. I, I don't know. At first, I, I don't know if either one. Can kill you or not kill you. Uh, I'm I'm uh, prejudiced against cholesterol, so I and don't. And how high is yours? I have high cholesterol. Yes, sir. There you go. Yeah, the, but I but I feel I'll exercise my way out of it. So mm-hmm. it's not good. No, no, I'm tired of the but I'm tired of all these drugs. There has to be a natural way to reduce all these things, and if that means limiting some food, or some of the intake of the food, that's fine. You do that. It's better you to be healthy. Get, you don't get cholesterol. From what you eat, it's mostly a genetic process. Your, it, the genetic makeup determines how much cholesterol your body produces. Correct, but very little a, every, of that is added to by what you eat. That's a, no, that's a food okay. police fallacy. Okay, I'm I'm not going to argue right, that right, right now. We digress. But it's right. Uh, but I'm just saying that there's enough information out there to say what the danger parts out, and, uh, and there's if there's research as to what can help and cannot help. And again, just taking the drug that will block certain things, stop your body from producing certain things, and yet have tremendous, uh, potentially tremendous side effects, side effects yeah. is not worth the risk when they have yet to prove that 
in this case, cholesterol, causes heart attack. They have not proven that. This uh, seems to be a correlation, not proven, by any stretch of imagination. Okay, so I think that's, again, we have to get off the scare tactics when we're looking at these things and say, well, what's the real evidence out there for everything? And then we can make logical decisions about what we want to do. Of course, that's not halacha, that's just, but that's where halacha brings you, by the way. When you see how the halacha works and you see how the whole system works, that is very well thought out from beginning to end, then you develop that sort of thinking and that process will bring you through everything. So when somebody makes, maybe the right or the left politically, makes a dumb statement or makes a statement that is an extrapolation of something else, the religious thinker immediately says, A does not equal B. How you go from A to B is beyond my kind of understanding. And I have listened to these pundits, as it were, maybe the right or the left, and it's normally the right at this point I'm, I'm listening to, because I'm driving the car, and that's what it said, okay, without mentioning names. And I am thinking sometimes, you are so far off base for your extrapolation, you know better than the other side. And it disappoints me. It really does disappoint me when they do that. Stick to the facts, as what's this tracking Joe Friday. Say. <laughs> Joe Friday, stick to the facts. Just the facts, facts ma'am. Let the facts speak for themselves. And we'll figure everything else out. We can be smart, intelligent people. But, of course, their audiences, they assume, are not. So they make these gigantic extrapolations, which is just, you listen to it and you say, where are you guys coming from? Again, it's both sides. Uh, and it's very disappointing. It really is. Okay. It's almost like the one by turning to cause the percentage of consensus. But if you have a a consensus of fools, you don't get a very good result. Yes. That's what it is. As, as our election show. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So now, uh, according to. Uh, sorry. So, what can one ma- demand from someone who has never tasted wisdom in his life? As such, a per- as such, a person should make an effort to overcome all his enemies and to strengthen his heart to study halakha, he should not give in to despair, that cruel, destructive element. Again, he's very much, is very pro during halakha, because like I said, it sets the mind. You understand what's going on. It's a logical jump. It's not even a jump. It's a logical progression, and you know where you're going. It is not impossible that sometime or other a spark of truth may overtake such a person, awaken him, from his deep sleep. A thought will occur to him. Maybe it's not too late. Maybe I can still acquire wisdom. From, uh, from many of the pillars of the Torah, the Torah world settled down to learn Torah when they were already advanced in years. I too, if I work hard, keep at it, might acquire Torah knowledge and understand is deep wisdom. But the feeling of shame that encumbers such a desired move hinders him. And he quickly distracts himself and turns to more pleasant thoughts, remaining at his starting point. About him, it is said, the bashful cannot learn. So we always, when we're learning Perkevo, when it says, the bison, hello, a bison lame, that the embarrassed one can't learn, we always interpret that, well, I shouldn't say always, most people want to interpret that, I know the speech I've heard, that we have to ask questions. If you don't ask a question, there's no such thing as a dumb question. You have to ask every question. First of all, there is such a thing as a dumb question. Yes. Cash your class. <laughs> right. It's, but if some people believe that the question is such a powerful question, my advice to everybody who believes they have the biggest question on anything is to talk the question out with yourself. Don't even say it to the world yet. Think it to you, talk it out, hear the question in all its glory. Okay? 
And if you really think after you've talked it out and you heard the question out loud, you still think it's a good question? By all means, ask the question. But I, I would suggest that if you really spoke your question out loud, you may come to realize, yeah, <laughs> I don't think that's the real question. And you also may find that's your answer, by the way. Because when you speak it out loud, again, you're hearing it, your mind is hearing it, instead of just up here, you're actually hearing it, and you can start having a conversation with yourself. You can't be bashful about it. And most people are not bashful to speak to themselves in a private place. I wouldn't advise doing this in a classroom or in a show. <laughs> That's when it's, it's getting nuts. But if you're by yourself washing your dishes, as I always say, or mowing the lawn, that's when you talk it out. Try to figure it out. I, I just had a question. I told you. I, I know what I told. But on uh, Shabbos, I was learning the Gemara Chagiga. I had a question. And I thought I had a strong question. Half of your rabbi, Gutnicki, was walking by. Pulled them over and said, come here. I have to ask you a question on the Gemara. He said, I didn't study it. It doesn't matter. Then I asked you anyway. I talked it out. I said the question. I said, forget it. I already know the answer. Because <laughs> once I heard the question, I said, oh, you can argue it? Okay. That's how it works? Fine. Thank you so much. Okay? And that's why, by the way, that's why psychologists, they like you to speak. Because normally by speaking, you work out your own problem. And then you pay them the money. It's also less work. That's also true. Yeah. Work. Correct. That's uh, for all the uh, psychiatrists out there. But it's, it's true that if I talk it out, I sometimes hear my problem. So I say, oh, you know what? I could probably do this. And all you hear from the other person is, uh-huh. And that's it. And you've solved your problem. So that's what really, that's how we normally understand the bashful. Here, he's saying that the bashful person is one who says, I'm too ashamed to change. I'm too ashamed to let people not know that I can't do A, B, or C. If you really want to know, you will, we, talk, we always talk about why some of your friends will make, will, will make fun of you for learning Hebrew, the Jewish friends. And the bottom line is, they're too ashamed to admit that they can't read it. And they don't know it. And here you are, a non-Jew learning it, and studying at a high level at this point. And you should continue for the rest of your life. Okay, very nice. And they are embarrassed that somebody would take their stuff and actually think that it's important when they have abandoned it long ago. But they will never, ever be able to admit that. So they can never come to class. They will never come to class. Not even if their own rabbi would present the class, they will never go because they're too ashamed. And that's what he's talking about. If a person is too ashamed to, to let people know that he's not what he's thought to be. I mean, this, you're talking to some many times doctors, lawyers, and professionals who cannot read, who cannot uh, do anything in the service, who do not know Torah. But they don't want to go to a class learning that because they used to be at the top of their class. And now they're my eight-year-old knows more than that in Torah. In Torah. Not, not in law, not in law, not in medicine, but in Torah, my eight-year-old will know more. And that's pretty intimidating. And you don't want to go for that. So you say, it's ancient, it's foolish, it's a crutch. Every single possible thing you can come out. That's what it means. That's how he's understanding a low, a bison lame. That an embarrassed person in a bashful slash embarrassed cannot learn you won't go you won't go even into it you're just so embarrassed that you didn't know it and you won't be part of it that's a very hard thing to overcome so now the trade of bash this trade of bashfulness has its place among the more desired character traits and the teachers of morals do their best to instill it in all of their students. 
much time is spent in, in, in uh, investigating the causes that prevent one from acquiring this, this trait. So the people will learn to distance themselves from them. The opposite of bashfulness and the sense of shame is a trait of wicked brazenness, which our sages viewed with much repugnance. But here this beloved trait is transformed into an agent of evil as it is being used improperly. In other words, the, the, the being a ba uh, bashful. If a bad trait is bad, then a good trait being misused is even worse than that and an impediment. The teachers of morals have written much about every bad trait, explaining its faults and condemning it at great length, investigating remedy, remedies for it and offering cures for it in their treatises. Now we've studied enough Musser to know that what he's saying is absolutely correct. If you look at We've done Shari Tshuva, the Gates of Repentance, the Passage Up, and so on and so forth. If you look, we even started, uh, we started Orchot Tzadikim. Okay? Any one of these will look at these traits and show you why they're bad and how to improve them. The best one, by the way, is Talmud Devar. In my, in my opinion, it's short, and that's why I like it. It's short to go through it. It's, it's, it's doable. Talmud Devar. Okay? But he gives a way for us to understand something. And so, here, like I said, so they're telling us the teacher of morals has written much about every bad trait, like I said, explaining its faults and condemning it at great length and investigating remedies for it and offering cures for it in the uh, treatises. But the damage caused by a good trait that is out of place is both painful and severe. Out of humility and a sense of modesty a person is discouraged from acquiring wisdom. How happy he would have been had he been armed in the, in the instance where the trait of boldness and audacity, when his conscience was berating him for having failed, for having left Torah, the pure source of life. So sometimes, and this is Orchot Tzedekin, by the way, if you have a, you should, I just give you the book, but it's, uh, that's what he does. Again, he shows a balance sheet of both. You shouldn't be arrogant, but sometimes you have to be a little bit arrogant. You have to be bold. You have to be audacious. What's your audacity? To go to the base matters. To let people know, hey, you know what? I'm not a dumb Chalcom. I don't know this. I need to learn. But that 70-year-old lawyer who came to the yeshiva and tried to keep up with the... Again, he didn't, he didn't so badly. Okay? Or for the, for the other doctors and psychiatrists who came to the yeshiva, and started to learn giving up their practices for a little while. They actually went on break for, I think, Sabbatical. six months. Sabbatical. They were, I think they were there for two or three months to re-engage themselves with Judaism, hopefully to continue on with the rest of their life. But they had the guts to say, I'm not going to think I know everything. I'm not going to let people know. They sat with us again. That takes guts. It takes a lot of guts. And that's what he's talking. When you, sometimes you have to be bold in the says, No problem. Hence, he has lived most of his life, and soon everything will be lost forever. In his imagination, though, he sees the raised eyebrows of some person or another, and this causes him to feel ashamed. He cannot overcome this false image produced by his imagination. That's all it is. It's a world of lies. Okay? A bit of impudence... Uh, and audacity, and he will see things right. What are the thoughts of the moral uh, man? Uh, I'm sorry. What are the thoughts of a moral human being? They fly away like a dream. Why should you yield to the face of another's assessment? Why shouldn't you yield when faced with the endless shame that threatens you if you remain empty, laboring fut futilely, and born not? Fortify yourself, human being. Clothe yourself in courage. Energize yourself, energize yourself and set about studying halacha vigorously. Now, you have many people, this is something that does happen, and it's sad. When people do go back to yeshiva, oh, they do, do, do go back to learning. So one of the ways to try to stop them, that I have noticed, is people say, oh, you're a masmid suddenly. You're a perpetual student suddenly. 
a denigrating remark. Now the person has to look at that and say, either, yes, deal with it. That's the boldness, that's the audacity that goes with it. Or the person will say, no, I, don't, I just want to go back a little while. What are you picking on me? Again, defensive. But at the same time, it's eating at him. How dare you? you know, you're picking on me. And so on and so forth. But it also hurts the, the person. So that's why it says, again, Tomer divorce, since I'm giving that the, uh, the big plug today. In the Pompeo Devara, it says that one should never discourage a person from learning. Rather, pay them to be part of the yeshiva and do everything you can to support them because that is what's holding the world up. Uh, again, one would argue that these are all rabbis. Of course, they have to sell their wares and so on and so forth. So I'm not going to argue like that. You do what you want. If they really believe that that's why Tomah Devorah and the uh, rabbi Karelitz, uh, Karelitz, thank you. Karelitz is saying that the cousin is saying that. I'm not going to convince him otherwise. This tape will never convince him. But the bottom line is that that is what holds the world up. That's what we believe as Jews. That the study of the Torah, the living of the Torah, that's what we live for. And again, if you have that as the focal point, that serving Hashem is what we're here for. And you know, to serve Hashem, we have to know what to do. So that's that's it. And the fact that I have to work to make a living is just the way the teva of the world works, the nature of the world works. And that's all because Adam and Chava messed up the system. Okay, And we're paying for that dearly. I think we have to work out here in this lack of Gan Eden, although in that sense, isn't that, thank God. <laughs> I like that. Uh, if, if, you don't, if you can't be in Gan Eden, the U.S. isn't that bad. <laughs> For a little while. Ah, thank God. We'll survive all. Before this week. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> we all say. But, uh, but that's what he's saying. We have to get through that, through all people making fun of us, through everything else, through ourselves. By the way, the biggest thing is sometimes we look at other people and we assume what they're thinking. And they may not be thinking that. They may be admiring us or they may be thinking uh, nothing. They have no thought about us whatsoever. I know many times when I'm davening, and I, as the person has to keep it saying the pages, I sometimes have the, I feel the pressure of people who are standing doing nothing. But when I look around, I see everybody's praying. It was just my imagination. Hmm. And so most are to me. That, you know, while, yeah, I have to keep the, the show going, as it were. But if I don't, I shouldn't be worried that they're not doubting because, thank God they are. And they're not going so fast that they're beating me so much. Okay, and, but that's something that we have to think about. So when I'm learning, when I'm doing anything else, even if I feel a pair of eyes on me, I think I do anyway, I should just say, you know what, ignore it because it's probably just my imagination, which it normally is. Okay, we'll have to stop there.